morning again. A couple of additional announcements. Uh, I might have been spreading some misinformation concerning donating uh, to Kendra and Jordan. Don't write Kendra and Jordan on the memo section of your check if you're doing that. There are some post-it notes out in, on the uh, welcome desk. Put a little post-it note on your check or on your, your cash or whatever, and that will help us to best designate that money to them in Mexico if you'd like to, to help them out in that way. Also, I completely forgot this morning about the Good Friday devotionals. For those of you who messaged me at some point during this week and, and asked for one, they're at the place where we used to do coffee, we'll, where we'll be doing coffee again pretty soon. Uh, your name is written on your bag, and if you asked as a couple, your names are written on your bag, and there are two in the bag. But the ones that say Good Friday on them are the extras. I can make more if, if they run out, so don't be afraid to come up and ask me. I'll do that for you. Uh, but there is only one per person in those bags, so keep that in mind. And um, they're single use uh, at that. So just a couple different things to keep in mind. And uh, remember, don't forget to grab a palm. There's plenty of them out there. It's something you can hang up at your, at your home or whatever. My wife Carrie and I met while we were both students at Cincinnati Bible College. Yes, Carrie first laid eyes on me in the back seat of Old Testament history class. Excitement. But it wasn't until sociology that she really started to be become fond of me, where she decided to actually sit next to me. So we started talking, went on a few just casual dates, ice cream, coffee, stuff like that. But I decided I'm going to take this up a notch. I'm going to really work on reeling her in. So I came up with the most romantic date that I could think of as a 20-year-old guy. I took her to a hockey game. <laughs> hey, you're laughing, but it worked. <laughs> We've been married almost 16 years now, and look at us now. So guys, keep that in mind. But not long after this hockey game, I decided to invite her to meet my parents. I can't remember exactly. It was either raining that night or it, it had just recently rained because the ground was soft and wet. And when we pulled up the house, I must have parked my 1996 Ford Taurus on the side of the right side of the, the driveway because maybe I even parked way too close because it forced Carrie when she got out of the car to walk in the grass, the wet, soft grass. Keep that in mind. But we walked in, and uh, we headed towards the living room where, where the couch was. That was the best area, I guess, to, to meet my parents. I don't know. And when I, I turned around, she was trailing me. And to look back towards the door, I noticed footprints, muddy footprints, all over my parents' white carpet. <laughs> For some reason, instead of being a, a refined gentleman, without thinking, I just yelled, Hey, Mom! Do we have any carpet cleaner? Carrie tracked in some mud. <laughs> Blamed it all on her. You know, sometimes our, our entries are not very triumphant. Sometimes the paths we take are, are a little bit muddy. But sometimes these imperfect pathways lead to something. And they lead to victory. Good morning and happy Palm Sunday. Uh, today we reflect upon this wonderful day, this day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Maybe on the surface, we're like, okay, pretty cool. Uh, I've, I've read that in my Bible before, but what's the significance other than we get to take a cool souvenir home here this morning? Well, riding into a city might not seem like a huge deal, but this event signified the very moment that Jesus was heading towards the throne the very throne of God. From that point on, from this point on, his ministry was, was changing. The events had much more impact and significance with each and every move he made. The long-awaited Messiah had arrived here on earth. The anticipation behind all those hopes threw the crowd of Jerusalem into this amazing frenzy, and they burst forth in song and in praise. And this song and praise wasn't just willy-nilly, 
happy, joyous. This was song and praise for a king, reserved only for royalty. They threw their cloaks. They waved palm branches in the air. They shouted these words like, Hosanna, the saving king has arrived. So this morning we reflect upon Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem, riding into Jerusalem on a young donkey, and it's a triumphal entry with an immense amount of historical, biblical significance. We celebrate the arrival of the king and the beginning of his reign on a pathway to victory. This morning we conclude our little two-week series as we bump up uh, to Easter, uh, for those of you who who didn't know, Easter's next week. That, that's just crazy to me. Uh, but during this series, we've, we've just been exploring John chapter 12, and hopefully you've had a time to, to read and reflect upon this chapter on your own throughout the week. And that's what I suggest you do anytime uh, you, you hear Scripture preached. Read it yourself as well. That's very important. Because the reason we're doing this specifically is because John chapter 12 is such a major turning point, especially in John's gospel. It's at this point in his narrative that we come to the last week of Jesus' life. One week until the cross. And as we said last week, the, this, the series Pathway to Victory, you might, you might see uh, the picture on the graphic and, and think pathway, okay, it, it's, it's the trek to the cross. That's not exactly what we're doing. We're not taking the actual road of Gol to Golgotha. No, we're rather just looking at chapter 12 and, and looking at the three accounts here, found here, and, and we're looking at what is to come and how John is alluding to what is to come and the beautiful victory of God's unfolding divine plan. Last week, we explored two uh, separate accounts listed here, two major events in this, this chapter. And we leapt over Palm Sunday. We, we leapt over the triumphal entry. So now, now we'll go back and, and look at that. This morning on this Palm Sunday, we celebrate. That's why we're here. We're here to celebrate the arrival of our king, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And like I said, this event is sandwiched between the two stories that we read from last week. So let's read and let's kind of hook into what we read last week to kind of gain some of the, the proper context of where we were. John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. Meanwhile, and this meanwhile follows Mary and the perfume. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. All right, so immediately following Mary and her perfume, this very expensive nard from the northern Himalayan regions, we see these three quick verses, and John is, is framing the triumphal entry, which is to come next, within the story of Lazarus, the continued narrative here. And as you can imagine, bringing someone back from the dead is an incredible event, an event that immediately would spread news across the region. As John tells us, large crowds began to gather. Someone brought someone back from the dead. Honey, we're taking a road trip. Let's, let's go see this guy. Let's go find out what's going on. And they were there to see Lazarus, and they were there to see Jesus. They were there to see him both. And this the fact that many crowds were gathering was ruffling the feathers of the chief priests. This was ruffling the feathers of, of the leaders of the time. And it increased this plot to kill them both. And, and, and they wanted to kill Jesus. And they wanted to return Lazarus to his grave. And it, that thought and that movement was just beginning to grow and grow very strong. And as we talked about last week here uh, in, in chapter 12, this chapter is a, a major turning point, not only in John's telling of the account, but also in the life and ministry of Jesus. This, as we've been calling it, and I've been saying this over and over and over, this pathway to victory was beginning to just lay itself out and, and unfold this path towards the cross. 
Let's continue. Verses 12 through 15. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. John here is focusing on the crowd, on this large crowd that is, has gathered in Jerusalem and in Bethany and then on their way into Jerusalem. The day before, the crowds were, were swelling in Bethany. I want to see this guy who was raised back from the dead. I want to see this guy who did the raising. And people caught on, and people caught wind. And this culture, this first century culture, well, I'm sure they could spread news even faster than some of us on social media. The, the oral culture was just abound uh, with, with spreading news. That's all they had, so they did it well. And now this next day, if the crowds weren't already large enough uh, that we, we know of in Bethany, and, and of course in Jerusalem, things are getting even busier. Many scholars believe that roughly 50,000 people lived in Jerusalem, just on your typical, normal, every day. And during Passover, that number would immediately double. 100,000 people in, in the city. And, it's, and we have people from all over, religious pilgrims coming in just for Passover. We have people coming in from Galilee, and we have people following in from Bethany, as, as we read. And even last week, we read this wonderful and, and interesting account of Gentiles. These Greeks, uh, non-believers, coming into town to worship. And this is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's significant. When, when they're all on the same page with, with stories, you know that this is something that you need to pay attention to. This is something very relevant. Um, of course, it all is, but when they're all telling the same story, Listen up. Jesus rides into town within the frenzy of the crowds, and we call this the triumphal entry. And we call this Palm Sunday. I want you to take a look at the, the palm leaf that you have um, in your hand if you do. And if not, I'll pretend for a moment. We might see these in our churches once a year. Maybe outside that, they don't really hold any daily significance. We might see it and go, oh, okay, that, that's just a palm leaf. No big deal, leaves are leaves. For a Jewish Israelite, palms had become a great symbol of Jewish nationalism, kind of defined who they, they are. This, it's not similar to this, but it's really the only similarity that I could come up with. It's like a Canadian and a, and a maple leaf, in, in a way. Uh, I'm not Canadian, so I don't know the connection as well, but that's, that's my assumption. But, but palms were waved in the context of, this is who I am. This is my heritage. This is my bloodline. And when I'm waving this, this, this is a royal thing. This is a bloodline thing. This is who I am. This is my heritage. The palms re reminded the Jews of the great temple rededication. When they saw these leaves, they thought of the temple. Now, after it was, was destroyed, it was rebuilt again, and we did it as a nation, as a people. Palms reminded the Jews of the cherished celebration of, of Hanukkah and the Maccabean Revolt and things like that. And the, 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 the palms themselves were just a symbol of ruling power and royalty and authority and history. So for Jesus to receive a welcome that involved these branches, these leaves, it points to something more than just, just a branch off a tree. It, it points to hope, a depth of, of, of hope and a depth of security and mightiness and, and power directly towards this person that they were claiming in this moment to be king, to be king. This royal welcome grew, though. It grew even stronger. Not only was the crowd waving these palm branches that were reserved only for kings coming to town, but they were now beginning to shout. And they were shouting things that it should only be reserved for royalty. 
reserved for a king who just went off and conquered and, and has ridden back into town. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Hosanna is an Aramaic word, which means save us now. You're looking to your king for security. You're looking to your king in trust and in faith and in hope. In their power, in their might, they can protect and they can save you. The enthusiasm of the crowd had grown in this mighty way and it was now taking this this royal turn, and you can imagine how that was affecting the leaders and the priests who were hearing such a thing, exclaimed and proclaimed towards Jesus. Whether the crowd fully even realized it or not, maybe they're just all caught up, just like a bunch of uh, screaming people at a concert or something, you just kind of get caught up in the moment. The symbolism that was actually happening in their actions and in the words that were coming out of their mouths declared that Jesus is the one true king, the one that has been written about from days of old, the rightful heir to any throne. And it was within this moment that God was essentially opening up this beautiful door, this this pathway, you could say, to set Israel free. Jesus, the one true king, is paving the path of freedom for his people, the long-awaited path, the path that people have been waiting for during a time like this especially. This isn't just any random day of the week. This is a time of Passover, the celebration of the Exodus. Jesus marks himself by doing this as the new Exodus to set his people free, carving a pathway towards freedom, laying down a new covenant pathway between God and not just the Israelites, but God and all nations and all people. Now, as momentous and and symbolic as this this event and this moment truly was, not everyone understood what was going on. Not everyone understood the magnitude of of this moment. Not even his disciples Verse 16. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Maybe you remember back in 2014, or uh, somewhere in, I think, believe, Napa, California, there was a, an earthquake. 6.1, uh, whatever you, ca- caliber, is that what you say? An earthquake. And it happened around... 3.30 in the morning. When it happened, I remember seeing on the news just some coverage of what was going on, but then there was this very interesting news uh, article, you could say, of a baby in the earthquake. I remember when the video was released, they, they showed a baby monitor, and they, it was fixated on, on a baby in a crib. And around 3.30, boom, there goes the earthquake. Things are shaking. The crib is shaking, a rocking chair is rocking in the background of this baby's room. Everything's vibrating. Uh, the, the monitor itself, you can tell, is probably moving all around the dresser. And all this baby does is roll over one time. Doesn't wake up, doesn't cry, doesn't even whine. Just rolls over one time, and goes back to sleep during this earthquake. Now, first of all, why can't my kids be like that? <laughs> I, I walk up the stairs, and they're, they're all awake uh, at, at our house. But secondly, and, and more the point, this kind of thing, sleeping through an earthquake, happened to the, our disciples here. And many others on that, that first Palm Sunday, they slept through the magnitude of the earthquake. They missed the very significance of the event that was actually taking place all around them. The earthquake was all around them. The mighty symbol of the arriving King Jesus was in in their face, in their presence. But essentially, they slept right through it. They missed the significance. The crowds ultimately failed to understand the true nature of what was happening in that moment, the divine kingship of the arriving Jesus. And unfortunately, the disciples missed the mark too. 
Sure, the disciples might have seen the messianic nature, and I'm so glad that afterward they went, oh, we missed that. They went back and they searched the Old Testament scriptures and said, wow, can you see the things that were prophesied that happened in Christ? But in the moment, they just could not see that pathway. They could not see down that road. They didn't understand the magnitude of, of the moment. And with Palm Sunday, the true meaning of Jesus' mission was actually being revealed in this moment. The king that came to save is the king that gives his life. Jesus foretold this. To Nicodemus earlier in John's gospel. Let's read John 3, 13 through 18. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Don't miss the earthquake. Don't miss the significance. Church, your king has come. Your king has come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Behold your king. Behold your king. King Jesus, the saving king. Now, as we mentioned earlier, unlike the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John actually frames this event within the Lazarus account within the framework of that miracle of him raising from the dead. And in verses 17 through 19, it says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. In this beautiful way, John reminds us, that this spark that began the fire of this entire event, of this, this week leading up to the cross, began with Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And this was driving the Pharisees nuts. It was driving them to just despise him. And obviously enough to kill him. And I find it incredibly interesting what the, the Pharisees say here. Because what they are saying, they're saying in a snarky way, but they are speaking so much truth at the same time. See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So just stop for a minute and take that in. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Last week we read the, the paragraph that immediately follows this, and that's the story of the Greek Gentiles coming to see him. Don't you just love how John flows that into there? The whole world is indeed coming after him. The Pharisees use this word, the Greek word cosmos. I'm sure you know that even if you don't know Greek. It means the entire world. It means the, the, the entire human race, cosmos. And while I read this sentence, uh, to me at least, it almost sounds like the Pharisees are kind of being like over-exaggerating teenagers. Uh, not to rip on any teenagers who are listening here this morning. It's just one of those like, ah, oh, the whole world is going after him. <laughs> when it's really just Jerusalem in that moment. But they didn't know that the whole world indeed is going after Christ. Is this, the Pharisees, are, are, they're standing at this distance in their infinite superiority. They, they just think they know away from the common people what should be happening. But they're actually speaking what is happening. But I love it because John wants us to almost use their words in a playful way against them, not in a mean way, but for truth. There's truth even in your snarkiness. 
John is essentially saying, yes, you are indeed right. You are indeed right. Jesus certainly will draw the whole world onto himself. That's what's coming down the pathway to victory. The pathway of Jesus. It's a pathway that's full of destruction. It's a pathway that has a cross, but it is a pathway to a glorious victory. Jesus has come into the world because God so loved the world. Jesus has come into the world so he can rescue his sheep. Yes, the lost sheep of Israel, but also the sheep from all nations of the world. The saving king will conquer sin. The saving king will conquer death. The saving king will redeem all people, all people who claim allegiance. To the king. Palm Sunday foreshadows the full confidence and assurance that each and every one of us has in Jesus. As we come to this, this week that has begun today, Holy Week, we point, point forward with anticipation of a glorious resurrection, the pathway to victory. When you fix your attention on Christ Jesus this week, when you fix your attention on him, what do you see? What do you see? What do you behold? We see him who gave himself a once and for all time sacrifice of sins. We see him who has obtained for us an eternal redemption, forgiveness, a rescue from the sins of our past present and future, we see him who has gone out in front of us down a pathway to victory to obtain and to give to us an eternal inheritance. So this morning, as the worship team makes their way forward, we can look ahead with confidence. We can look ahead with hope because we have a new past, we have a bright future, and in this present moment, we are changed in the very depths of of our being. This revolution that began, this achievement of the cross, this defeat of death, is why we call this Friday Good Friday. Although it's filled with, with sorrow, although it's filled with, with death, it is a Good Friday because it is the time when Christ Jesus accomplished these amazing things, these glorious, victorious events. He sets the captives free and renews us to walk in his ways. He has paved the path to victory and invites you to walk down it. And that offer is open to anyone, anyone willing to accept it. If this morning, on this Palm Sunday, you have decided to accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, your saving King, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, and living a new life in him. Would you please come forward as we all stand together and sing?